Tonight we're going to look at wisdom toward money, wisdom toward finances, saving, enjoying money, future planning, and even estate planning. The book of Proverbs speaks to all of this, and we would be wise to go to this book of wisdom and let it speak to us with the authority of the divine inspiration that it is, God's voice to us, and allow it to help us to think wisely about Money. I need God's help, so I'm going to pray. I trust you'll join with me in prayer, and then we'll dive into the Scriptures. Father, we thank you for this opportunity here tonight to gather in Jesus' name. Father, we're so grateful that we gather being covered and sanctified in the blood of Christ, being saved in His ransom and redemptive sacrifice, and being justified through his resurrection, Lord God. We thank you for grace. We thank you, Lord God, that this book, this Bible speaks to every area of our life. It does so unapologetically, Lord God. It does so authoritatively. And I pray tonight that we would go to the book of Proverbs and learn what it has to teach us about money and our relationship to money and how to be wise with money in such a way that we are students of your wisdom and your word tonight, Lord God. Use your word to bless, encourage, challenge, and exhort us. We are this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible actually has copious amounts of wisdom speaking in, in regards to money. You've probably heard it said, I'm sure at least once, that this was one of Jesus' favorite subjects to teach on. And it truly was. You may have heard people exaggerate that and say, Jesus spoke more about money than any other thing. That's, that's actually not true, thankfully for that. He spoke more about the gospel and the kingdom and those ideas. But money was one of his, certainly, his most favorite subjects to address. And what he saw as one of the greatest needs in his teaching ministry was to address Money, and I think that in the last, well, this has kind of been a human, a human problem forever, to be quite frank, but at least in the last few generations, maybe just the last few decades, we have seen the, the onset of these kinds of, these kinds of so-called Bible teachers and preachers and televangelists who make their whole ministry about money, that those of us that are more conservative and don't necessarily buy into that, we can also feel a little bit burned by that. Maybe, maybe you've been part of a church experience. Experience, or you were a member at a church where there was actually abuse of membership over this issue of money. And I can just, I'll just reassure all of you here tonight that as a, as a preacher and, and a Bible teacher, I feel like this is a hard topic to tackle, not because there's not copious amounts of content in Scripture. It's not hard to get content. It's hard to tackle because you always feel like you almost need to apologize or you feel like you need to kind of be nervous or unsure about this. And I want to preach and share this wisdom tonight in a manner that conveys the authority of Scripture. It's true. I'll tell you this. I don't think many of you know this. My wife probably does. I've only ever preached on money. That means like a whole sermon. I don't mean like we talked about money in the sermon or a tithing was brought up or offerings or different things. I mean a full sermon that was just dedicated to thinking about money. I think I've only ever done that twice. And I've preached for 20 years. And so that means... Firstly, that I'm not enough like Jesus as I need to be. And it means, secondly, there's a lot of catching up to do. So stand by. The series on money is coming so that I can catch up some of that lost ground. Of course, I'm kidding. And tonight, as we go to the book of Proverbs, we need the Scripture, as I've said already, to speak to us its wisdom with its authority so that we can know what God would have us and how God would have us live. We know that Jesus taught this. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and money. This comes from Matthew 6, 24. Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is an idiom for money. You you can't be the servant of both. If you're going to relate to money in a healthy way, you must relate to money as a servant to you and a servant to God's calling on your life. You cannot relate to money as though it is a master over you and you slavishly serve it. There's no better gauge, truly, there's no better gauge to check the condition of our hearts than to see how we serve God with our money. To see how we serve God with our money. Jesus taught also in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we all need this sober reminder tonight 
that a craving for money is the root of all kinds of evil. We see this in 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, hear that phrase, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is, this verse, is among the most misquoted verses in all of the Bible. You may have heard it, I've heard it countless times, that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible teaches. That phrase is nowhere in the Bible, but it is a craving for, a love for money, That is the root of all kinds of evil. And through that craving, Paul says, many wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. There's there's two results to this. There's on the one hand, the people that crave after money. And to them, it it is a stumbling block and a cause of them abandoning their faith. And for others, this craving after money maybe doesn't cause them to abandon the faith per se, but it causes them to be pierced with so much pain and their life fraught with great tribulation. Now, I feel like we need to be really clear about one thing here tonight, that money is not a dirty or a sinful thing in and of itself. Money is and should be observed as a vehicle of both good and evil, righteousness and, and unrighteousness. Money, money is amoral. How money is employed and used will dictate whether we produce good or bad, but money in and of itself should not be seen as a dirty or a sinful thing. And Scripture is clear about this. Now we start to work our way through these different Proverbs. So Proverbs 10.22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. There is no shame, no shame. There is no sense of sinfulness or or dirtiness if God, in blessing a person, a believer, makes them rich. There's nothing about that innately sinful. Now, sometimes we don't always have that category in our thinking. The Bible tells us there are actually two types of both rich people and poor people. There there are two types. There are two types of rich people and two types of poor people. On the one hand, the rich, there are the righteous rich, the ones who have the blessing from God, the ones who work hard, invest wisely, and, and they honor God first with their money, and God makes them wealthy. And that's a good thing. That's a holy thing. That is a thing for which God should be praised and thanked. Of course, there's the unrighteous rich. Remember, two times, two types of both rich and poor. The unrighteous rich, the Bible tells us, particularly Proverbs, they steal, they defraud, they lend at high interest, they are corrupt, they are people that are sinful and ungodly, and they can also be rich. The Bible says there's two types of poor people. There's the righteous poor. They come from a place of disadvantage. Or maybe, like Jesus and the apostles, they, they choose rather a life of poverty in order to serve others or whatever the case may be. You cannot have a theology that says everyone who's poor is not under the blessing of God. When you turn to the Bible and read the story of Jesus, he had nowhere to lay his head. He had nowhere. He says to one would-be disciple, if you are a fox or a bird, you at least have a place to call home. But the Son of Man has nowhere to go. Jesus lived a life of intentional poverty for the sake of the mission. And he was a righteous, poor person. There is a biblical category for that. And the other category is the unrighteous poor. Proverbs has a lot to say about the unrighteous poor. They are lazy. They are gluttonous. They they go in as a surety for their neighbor. There's more than once the book of Proverbs says this. If you go in as guarantor for your neighbor, expect to become poor. The scripture tells us that there's the unrighteous poor. Now, what does all that mean? The upshot of that is you cannot look at someone's bottom line. You can't look at someone's bank balance or investment portfolio and say, I know for a fact whether they are righteous or unrighteous. Someone's someone's bank balance or their their status of wealth or not wealth, their status of poverty, is never a sign of whether they are righteous or not. It's an an important point. A fundamental key, the book of Proverbs encourages us to achieving financial independence and wealth is about properly evaluating what is an asset and what is a liability. What is costing you to own, to have, to use, and what is benefiting you financially. 
Now, you can't read the book of Proverbs all the way through, and, uh, and whether you like to mark your Bible or, or not, I don't like to mark Bibles, it's not my thing, but if you do, and you went ahead and you kind of put a mark, maybe a dollar sign next to every single proverb that talks about money or wealth or poverty or being poor or whatever it may be, you'll find that there is the lion's share of the book speaking in some way, direct or indirect, about that. And time and time again, the book of Proverbs encourages you to evaluate predominantly God giving wealth as a blessing. And so the book of Proverbs uses the, the, the natural desire to be more financially independent as a means to goad us, encourages us into obedience. That's an important point. What that means is that while the book of Timothy says the craving after money or the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, that's true. It doesn't mean that you should be utterly ambivalent toward money. If that was your, if that was your attitude, then many of the Proverbs would, would actually have no traction with you at all because you don't care. The Bible's not asking us not to care. The Bible's asking us to be wise, to properly estimate the value of wealth and money and to be wise with it. And one way that we need to do that is to understand that assets and liabilities are antithetical. There are things that we invest our money in that are nothing other than a black hole of debt. There are things that we invest our money in that are actually beneficial. Let's take a look at those. What does the book of Proverbs say are assets in our life? The first one, and the one that gets the most traction in the book of Proverbs, is wisdom. Is wisdom. Invest whatever you must to get wisdom. It'll be the key to understanding and growing in financial independence. Let me read you a few verses. And these just, these just kind of line up how, how, how overwhelming the preponderance of these verses are. I'm going to give you the reference, then read it. If you're trying to follow me in your Bible, you're going to have to have nimble fingers. Maybe you can write the reference down and later on check it. But let me read these together. Proverbs 3.16, long life is in her hand. That's talking about wisdom. Long life is in wisdom's hand. Her left hand are riches and honor. Proverbs 8.18, riches and honor are with me. This is wisdom talking, personified. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. That's what wisdom gets. Proverbs 8.21 says, to endow those who love me with wealth. That's again, that's wisdom being personified. That's wisdom speaking. It says, I seek to endow those who love me with wealth, that I may fill their treasuries. So, so if the first part of that verse you wanted to spiritualize, the wealth is, is other things. It's not money, it's other things. The wealth is like charity and grace and love. Okay, sure. But the second part of that verse just makes it really clear we're talking about money. Because Proverbs then says, I want to fill their treasuries. Proverbs 21, 20. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man swallows it up. Proverbs 14, 24 says, The crown of the wise is their riches, but the, fool of the, f- the folly of the fools is foolishness. So, so getting a sense of the asset that wisdom is. Coming to the book of Proverbs and realizing that time and time and time again, the wise people are characterized as being shrewd with their money and making it grow is a godly and a glorious thing. And it is a righteous thing. It's not dirty, sinful, filthy. It's not yuck. It's not we shouldn't talk about that and, and we shouldn't think about that. The book of Proverbs says, if you are wise, then you are talking about it. You are thinking about it. You're not, you're not enslaved to it. You're not craving after it, but you're wise. And the wisdom of the wise is a crown of riches, says the book of Proverbs. So thinking about three main avenues of income, money, money coming into our life. The book of Proverbs addresses three main areas. Earning, so that's hopefully your day job, earning. Secondly, investment returns. And thirdly, inheritance. Now, I, I realize that if this, was a, if this was just a study on finances more broadly than the book of Proverbs, that could be a fairly elongated list. But we're trying to keep our focus on this particular book of wisdom. And these three areas are spoken of predominantly as the means of income. Now, for most people, the primary source of their income will be their job. It'll be their earning. It'll be what they do for work. 
Very few people will ever inherit more money than their day job will provide throughout their life. And fewer ever will strike it big through receiving some great inheritance or maybe some windfall of some sort. And you can look at the statistics on this. It's, it's fairly staggering when you actually when you look at how the data bears out this principle that those that have sudden windfall, maybe they're playing the lottery or maybe there was a grandparent or a great aunt that passed away and bestowed upon them a, a mass amount of wealth. And you can just look at how, how the data shows the uniformity of experience that after two to three years, they are at least financially back where they started. And many of them are far worse. Many of them have to declare bankruptcy within a five-year window because that influx of money did not help it, in fact, hindered them. And Proverbs has more to say about our day job than anything else as the primary means of our earning and our income. So let's look at a few ways that the book of Proverbs talks about, talks about the way that we think about our daily job, our Monday to Friday, in this what we call the workaday world, the nine to five. I know very few of us ever actually work nine to five, but those idioms still ring true. Let me give you some Proverbs. Firstly, Proverbs 6, verse 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Proverbs 10.4, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Proverbs 12.11, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who choose fantasies have no sense. Love that. Love that. You see that every day. Those that choose fair, those that are chasing the white whale. If I could only invest at this time, or I've got a certain thing, if I if I put all my money on this football team, if only if I can if I can just chance it and win, they chase fantasies. And what are they? Senseless. That's what the Bible says. But those who work their land, we could contemporize that slightly and say, those who are diligent in the labor of their day job, those are the ones who have abundance, according to Proverbs 12, 11. Proverbs 13, 11, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Again, there's a sense here, in, and if you diligently work at your job, you labor rightly with your employer, you serve that company, and you are wise in putting away little by little, it will grow. Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Idle chatter leads only to poverty. I'm sure, just like me, every one of you has seen that very proverb play out even on the job site or, or at your workplace or wherever it is that you go to earn your living, you can see that contrast explicit right before your eyes. That in labor there's profit. For those that just, those that just get busy, those that just get into it, get the job done, do it well, before the deadline, serve their employer as the scripture says to do it, there's profit in that. But those that would rather be off on the side, idly chatting and gossiping and murmuring, well, the boss doesn't take care of us and we're supposed to get that, that pay rise and we haven't got it and maybe we should unionize and all this, all this idle chatter that isn't getting the job done, the book of Proverbs is really clear. That's the road to poverty. Less talk, more work would be a way that I could, I could give that a paraphrase for you. Less talk, more work, and you will have profit and not poverty. I'll take a look at Proverbs 24, 33, 34. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Again, there's the constant reminder that if you are the kind of person prone to indolence, laziness, a little sleep, a little slumber. I'll, I'll get to work when I get to work. I know there's a, there's a start time, but I'll just I'll turn up when it, when it suits me. I'll hit the snooze on the alarm clock a few more times. I'm going to fold my hands and rest. If we are not diligent, then the thief will come and scarcity will arrive like an armed man. You won't be able to resist. 
Let's, let's distill all that. That's a whole slew of Proverbs for us to meditate and chew on. Let's distill it if we can. Let me give you some, some highlights. Firstly, work hard. Work hard. Don't be the sluggard that we've read about in the book of Proverbs. Don't look. Don't l- Let me rephrase that. Don't try and get away with doing less than you're asked to do by your employer. Don't try and look for downtime. Don't try and extend breaks. Don't try. Don't, this, is, this is an unchristian thing to do, to try and look busier than you actually are. Don't do that. It's not just laziness. It's actually deception and lying. Don't be that person. Don't overindulge in breaks. And don't expend your best energy doing other things. Don't be that kind of employee. The next thing we should see in all these Proverbs that we've read is wake up early, don't be tardy, and don't be unnecessarily absent. I don't care if your employer offers you 10 sick days per year, don't just take them because that is unbiblical and non-Christian. They are there for you to utilize when you have the opportunity and you're unwell. They're not just, well, I'll call in, I've got days stored up, I don't care. That's not a Christian attitude. If you are being paid to do work, then do the work you're being paid to do. That's clearly a biblical work ethic. And be thankful that we live in modern times that we do, that there is such thing as annual leave and sick pay and bereavement leave and personal days. These things, if they're offered by your employer, use them within the rules they're given and be thankful to God that they're there. But don't overindulge and mistreat your employer or take advantage of his generosity. The Bible says you will soon fall into poverty. So wake up early. Don't be unnecessarily absent. The next one, this is clear, show diligence. Don't be unmotivated. Don't be unmotivated. Do what you're expected to do and go beyond what you're expected to do. Be a problem solver, not a problem maker. Be a doer. Watch your words about how you talk about your company or your employer. Well, he's unfair. Maybe he is. But while you're still working there and taking a paycheck out of his back pocket to do work, you have agreed to work under those conditions. Be clear that the Bible gives us this wisdom and these parameters to honor and to obey. Be a problem solver, not a problem maker. Let me just give you a truism. Here's a truism, which by that I mean, here's a simple statement of fact that for the vast majority of people in the workforce, this is true for them. If only, if only they worked 10% harder than they currently do, if they showed up 10 minutes before start time, if they stayed 10 minutes after finish time, if they whined and grumbled less, they would all get a pay rise. They'd get a promotion. That's the way This works in a godly society, or at least a society that's founded upon biblical principles, then there is always going to be a merit-based system of being rewarded. Honor it. Work harder. Don't just get the job done within the time frame. Pat yourself on the back and say, I've been the wise person of the book of Proverbs. You haven't yet done what you're called to do. Remember this, that as far as promotions and pay raises go and different things, different benefits that happen in the workplace, it's always 99% effort and 1% talent. Bear that in mind. Let's talk a little bit about how the book of Proverbs addresses the scourge of debt, because it does. In fact, the book of Proverbs and the whole Bible, to be quite fair and quite honest, has nothing good to say about debt. Debt is always seen as a negative thing. A negative experience. We've seen in the last 15, 20 years of the way that these modern Western economies have gone. People have tried to reverse engineer and negative gear, forms of debt to, to make money and all that. And we could say the Bible knew nothing of any of that back in you know, 3,000 years ago when these proverbs were put together. And maybe that's true, but this wisdom is wisdom that's valid still for today. And we've seen the way things go when whole economies bottom out because people at greater numbers than what's safe begin to try and negatively engineer and try to negative gear debt. Be careful. That's what the proverb says. Be very careful about debt. Let me give you a few proverbs so you can hear it in the words of Scripture. Proverbs 17, 18. One who has no sense 
shakes hands in pledge, and puts up security for a neighbor. No sense. Proverbs 22 verse 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. You actively enslave yourself when you take on debt. Now, I'm not arguing that all debt is innately evil or bad. Some debt is a necessity in the way that our modern economies operate. I understand that. But while you have debt and wherever you have debt, you are enslaved to those particular lenders. That is clear and scriptural. Proverbs 22, verse 26 to 27. Do not be one who shakes hands in pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. There's two clear principles in those two verses in Proverbs 22. On the one hand, don't assume debt that you don't already have the means to repay. That is utter foolishness. And in the words of the book of Proverbs, you will lose even your bed And secondly, don't go guarantor for others who you think mean well and are sincere. That is the fool's errand. There's three wise investments according to the book of Proverbs. Three wise investments. Number one is the kingdom offering and generosity. The kingdom offering and generosity. We should understand as Christians better than anybody else understands, we should know as truth indisputable that every dollar that ever comes into our hands or or our bank account has come as the gracious granting of God. It may have been through our employer. It may have been through an inheritance. It may have been through a stipend or a dividend or whatever it may be. It is always God's gift of grace. Therefore, we must honor God first and foremost. The kingdom offering, as Scripture tells us, the book of Proverbs reiterates should be our priority. And not just the kingdom offering, giving to the church. We should all be giving to the church. The Bible is replete with statements on that. But we should be remembering the poor. We should be generous to the poor. The proverb says, He who lends to the poor, lends to the Lord. And the Lord will repay. Secondly, the second investment the book of Proverbs speaks of is saving, storing up. We've already read these examples of the ant. The ant comes out and sees copious amounts of food and it takes some to eat and it knows how to store some for those times of leanness. The book of Proverbs has plenty to say about those who little by little store up. Learn to be a person who saves. That is biblical and it is a principle of wisdom. Thirdly, the book of Proverbs talks about investing in education. It talks about us investing whatever we have to get wisdom, to get knowledge, to grow in our understanding. Now maybe, maybe we could just kind of distill that and say, well, that's just that's just school. You know, just just go to school, get your college degree, and do whatever study you have to do and pay off the debt whenever you can. Maybe, but but I'm not as convinced that we can quite make that fit or make that case. But certainly the book of Proverbs would encourage us to make our investment when it comes to buying resources to educate ourselves, to help us to grow, learn, and understand about financial health and other areas of health in our life. Maybe, maybe it's an online course you can buy. Maybe it's great resources from a local bookstore. Whatever it may be, the book of Proverbs tells us to invest in gaining knowledge. In all this, we should look to summarize all this in this key principle. Here it is in the book of Proverbs 21 verse 5. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely lead to poverty. So the key principle here, in all things that we've talked about, and I've tried to include as much as I can from the book of Proverbs, but I could not surely give an exhaustive study or summary on this, but it's have a plan. Stick to the plan. Be diligent. Think about your plan before you set it in action. And keep to it. Remember that, that money is like a flowing river. It can come in and it can go out just as fast. The obligation here is to set a plan in motion and be diligent. That will lead to financial independence. In the words of the book of Proverbs, the plans of the diligent surely lead to plenty. The last thing the book of Proverbs mentions, and it does this in a single verse, but... A verse that's profoundly encouraging, Proverbs 13, 22. 
This will be the last thing we mention here in the book of Proverbs about finances and money and spending and saving and all those things. Although, of course, we could have said a lot more. Proverbs 13.22 says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The book of Proverbs even goes to the lengths of explaining how if we are wise and good, if we have been diligent in our planning and shrewd with our use of this, this thing called money, then we'll be able to set up an inheritance that flows not just to our children, but unto our children's children. The good man leaves that inheritance. He does so wisely. We've seen, we've seen the onset of this of late in the last who knows how many years, the last generation or two, you see it now. You see, you see the bumper sticker, right, on the, on, on, the back of the, on the back of the car, the bumper sticker. I'm, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. And it's sort of like, well, it's meant to be kind of a snarky remark. And it's meant to be funny, but it's really unbiblical. Now, I'm not saying that in your, in your latter years, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you shouldn't older people who don't have dependents in the home anymore and you found your place in a state of retirement. I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy your lifelong labor and earning. You should. But you should remember that if you're going to be, according to the book of Proverbs, someone who's classified as wise and diligent and good, then you'll be sure to leave an inheritance for not just the first generation, but also the second. Such will be your diligence in how you handle wealth. There's a lot there. There's a lot more we could say. There's so much other information that would be good and helpful. But tonight, we have to restrict ourselves to these few comments. But if you would do me the honor and favor of joining me in prayers, we ask God to dedicate this word to our hearts that it may bear fruit in our lives. Father, we thank you for the book of Proverbs. Father, I think we've given you thanks for this book of Proverbs every single night that we've looked to tackle some practical subject in our life from this tremendous book of wisdom. We thank you, Lord, that King Solomon, when writing the book of Ecclesiastes, he has this poignant phrase, Father. He says, money answers everything. Help us, Lord God, not in one sense not to have unbiblical views of money. Help us not to look at it as, as dirty and grimy and wicked and sinful and, and a necessary evil. Help us to look on it as, as your vehicle to us so that we may see the kingdom extended and, and lives enriched, Lord God. Help us to have wise and biblical views. But Father, help us not to fall in love with it, to crave after it, to, to give of our best energy and our best time and our best study and diligence to, to money, but to remember, Lord God, that you call us to greater things. Father, help us. Help us to trust you to be our supply. Yes, we have employers, and yes, money comes in through different avenues, Lord God, but help us to be reminded that you are our supply. Help us to honor you, Lord God, with our money. Help us to be diligent and wise with our money, and help us to bring all glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 